Um, I just wanted to welcome you to the, the keynote um, address of the two-day conference um, that's taking place uh, at Worcester State and then tomorrow at Clark University all day. Uh, it's, a, it's a conference called Manufacturing Denial. Um, you can see the, the sort of full information here. I won't take time away from our speaker to explain much more about it. Um, but what, uh, what we've done is brought together um, two sets of issues that are um, of great significance, I think, in the, in the world today. Denial of scientific fact or sci credible scientific theories and denial of genocide and human rights, uh, mass human rights violations. Um, both of which are unfortunately very healthy industries, great way to make it in academia, in fact, if you want to get ahead, um, as many of us know. Um, and, and a real problem for, uh, for everybody in the, in the world and for different kinds of, of victim populations, especially around the world, whether it's because of the effects of climate change, suddenly submerging islands that they've lived on for, for centuries, or uh, because of renewed violence, because past violence against a group has been denied. Um, I just want to very briefly uh, thank the, the many groups um, across a number of institutions that have contributed um, funding to be able to put this conference on. Um, Clark University's Strassler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Clark University's Kalushin Mugar Chair uh, in Modern Armenian History and Genocide Studies, and Tanner Akcham is the, the holder of that, um, who is, is uh, here uh, supporting. Um, Rutgers, Uni Rutgers University Newark's Armenian Genocide Program, which is housed in its Center for uh, the Study of Genocide and Human Rights, and the National Association um, for Armenian Studies and Research. At Worcester State, because we're a state institution, we pull together funding from many, many, many different sources on campus, and I should give them all a, a little recognition. So our Office of the President, our President Barry Maloney, who couldn't be here tonight, I'm going to read a short statement from him later, was very supportive of this conference and really believes in, in the sort of academic ideals that it, that it really supports. Um, the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equal Opportunity, the International Programs Office, the Division of Graduate and Continuing Education, the Office of Multicultural Affairs, the Center for the Study of Human Rights, um, the Office of the Dean of Education, Health, and Natural Sciences, I'm almost done, um, the Office of the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, and finally the Departments of Chemistry, philosophy, and earth, environment, and physics. That last one's one department that pulls together a lot of interesting things. Um, and again, uh, President Barry Maloney was very sorry he couldn't be here. He's actually he probably would really much rather be here. He's in a two-day Board of Trustee uh, extravaganza meeting around strategic planning and things like that. So, uh, so he's not able to be here. But he did want to commend us for the work um, that this conference represents, and he had, gave me a short statement to read if that would be okay. Um, you are to be congrat uh, dear conference participants, you are to be congratulated for bringing together experts from the fields of social sciences and natural sciences to address the phenomena uh, of genocide denial and the denial of scientific truths, such as those aimed at evolution and global ch climate change. It is crucial that academics from different disciplines come together to counter claims that are made based on invalid or inaccurate research and that have no intellectual foundation. Such efforts to undermine fact-based knowledge must be countered vigorously by the academic community. Through your dedication and scholarship, I am confident that you are making a difference. I applaud your efforts and look forward to reading the proceedings from this conference. Sincerely, Barry Maloney, President of Worcester State University. Without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the uh, stage over to Hachik Maradian of Clark University, who is going to introduce uh, the program tonight. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be very brief as well. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome to the opening uh, discussion plenary of, of the conference on uh, denial. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we're going to be hoping to do here uh, is, 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 is looking, as, as Hank mentioned, at uh, denial both in the, in the social sciences and politics and in the natural sciences. Uh, I, I want to also provide a little overview of uh, how this conference uh, came, came to be, how the idea of this conference uh, became a reality. Uh, it all started, I think, where is Mark? Yes, a year ago, a year or so ago, when uh, Mark Mangonian, the, uh, the director of uh, NASA, published an article on manufacturing doubt, titled uh, Manufacturing Doubt and Genocide Denial in, in the Armenian Weekly, and in ensuing uh, discussions with uh, Professor Akcham and Mark, 
and eventually the rest of us, uh, we realized the importance of uh, bringing together scholars from the natural sciences and uh, from the social sciences to explore this phenomenon of, of denial. One of the things, one of the, uh, one of the central themes that uh, Mark dealt with in his article, and it's going to be one of the issues discussed in this conference, was, was the whole notion of manufacturing doubt, the creation of doubt. And uh, the, in his article, he has this very powerful quote from the cigarette industry, uh, which, beginning in the 1950s and all the way into the 60s and beyond, uh, realized the untenable situation of telling people that, you know, we don't really, we're not really sure if the cigarettes, if cigarettes kill you, right? So they, there had to be a way in which they could not come out and say, uh, well, cigarettes are perfectly healthy, right? But then a uh, nuanced approach to denying the damages that the tobacco industry is causing was to manufacture doubt. And, and this is one powerful uh, quote from that article that I mentioned earlier. It, is, it says, doubt is our product. Since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general population, the general public, it is also the means of establishing the controversy. So if you think about it, uh, much of what is uh, discussed in the broader context of denial nowadays is not outright denial as much as it's a nuanced, more nuanced approach of, of saying, you know, there's, there's, let's look at the other side of the story. And this is where uh, other cases in, in the natural, in the social sciences come forward in history as well, like the denial of the Holocaust, which will be discussed tomorrow, the denial of the Armenian Genocide, we have several speakers on that, and other cases, Burma, other cases uh, from around the globe. Uh, I, will, uh, uh, I will be, uh, I was not planning on reading the, the biographies of the speakers, but since many of you came in early and did not get a copy, I will, I will do that very briefly, and then I would invite Professor Nayan for his uh, 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 you know, speech, and then for Hank to provide remarks. Professor Nayan is assistant professor in the Department of Government at Dartmouth College. He, st he studies political scandal and mis misperceptions about politics and healthcare. He's a contributor to the New York Times politics policy website, The Upshot. Uh, previously, he served as media critic uh, for Columbia Journalism Review, co-edited Spin Sanity, a nonpartisan watchdog of political spin, and uh, he is, uh, uh, he's, he's the co he co-authored also the Older President's Spin, a New York Times bestseller. Uh, Henry Terrio is professor and chair of the philosophy department at Worcester State University here. He has published and spoken widely and on his research on reparations, victim perpetrator relations, genocide denial, genocide prevention. He is a founding co-editor of the peer-reviewed Genocide Studies International and was recently named the co-editor of Transaction Publishers, Genocide, a Critical, uh, a critical biographic review. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Knight. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. I want to thank the host for inviting me. And of course, thank you all of you for coming out on a Friday night. So uh, I'm a political scientist. So I'm going to be talking about this issue from a political science perspective and drawing on my own research, which is primarily in American politics. What I hope I can convince you of tonight is that the psychological processes that make people vulnerable to misperceptions are the same ones in a lot of different contexts. Okay? And what I'm going to try to show you is why people are so vulnerable to misperceptions, false claims, denial, and all of these things. Um, why it's so difficult to set the record straight and convince them that what they think isn't true, and how elites in the media sometimes feed into that. Okay? Um, so I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes or so, but please interrupt me if you do have clarifying questions as we go along. Then, of course, we're going to have uh, um, Professor Thirio uh, giving uh, commentary, and then we're going to open the floor up for questions. Okay? But um, if anything isn't clear as I go along, please do ask questions. Okay. So. Um, and I should acknowledge my co-author, Jason Reifler, on much of the research I'm going to show you today. Okay, so what's the problem in a nutshell? The problem is that people believe things that aren't true about the world. Okay? This is something that matters in the U.S. context. We often think about it in terms of the quality of our democracy. Right? Are citizens prepared to participate meaningfully in our democracy? Are they basing their opinions on accurate facts? Right? And are, or are politicians in some ways misleading them? Or are they causing politicians to pursue uh, arguments and lines of inquiry 
that aren't based on, on solid evidence. Okay? So one example that we'll talk about, global warming. Okay? So scientific evidence at this point is overwhelming for climate change. Uh, it's only grown stronger over the last few decades, and yet the U.S. debate over that issue has become more polarized, not less. Okay? If it were driven, if that debate were driven by science and evidence, the consensus would be stronger. Instead, it's more divisive. Right? Why? Why is that? Okay? Um, now, but this is a problem, of course, that isn't limited solely to the U.S. context. There are all different ways that we sometimes don't want to listen to information that's uncomfortable to us. And in some cases, that can, constant, that can get to the level, uh, as you heard in the introduction, of denying genocide and other sorts of historical wrongdoing, mass killings, and things like this. Okay? So uh, again, I'm going to be focusing primarily on the U.S. context, but I hope you can see the ways in which the same sort of processes I'm going to describe to you could contribute to denialism in all different sorts of contexts. Okay, and I hope that's an issue we can talk about in the Q&A as well. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem is we'd like to think that this is the world we live in. Okay, now it looks silly when you put it up there like that. No one would actually say that the facts are what f helps form people's opinions or that the facts are going to resolve a given debate. But that's actually the implicit assumption in a whole bunch of different fields if you really think about it. In education, in health, in journalism, in science, when people believe things that aren't true, the implicit assumption is if we give them the correct facts and evidence, that'll be enough to change their minds. Okay? Whether it's scientific evidence, historical evidence, whatever the case may be, we often assume, well, we gave them the facts and information, that should be enough, or that will be enough. We don't even have to see if it works or not. We just assume that that's the correct, appropriate, or most effective response. Okay? And what I'm going to show you are all the reasons why that might not be true. Why in some cases giving people facts and evidence is ineffective, and in some cases can actually make the problem worse. Okay? The problem is, as I'm sure you've all encountered, as you've tried to convince someone of something they don't want to hear, or someone has tried to convince you of something that you don't want to hear, is that we often more respond more like this guy, right? When we hear things that we don't want to believe, we're naturally resistant up to them, okay? And it's important to underscore that this is a fundamentally human response. We all do this, okay? We all have this instinct. No one wants to hear that they're wrong, and in particular, no one wants to hear that they're wrong about issues that matter to them. Okay? Issues that are relevant to your identity or your sense of yourself and your place in the world. Okay? So when it comes to those highly controversial issues that are so often linked to issues of identity, whether it's political, religious, economic, social, sexuality, whatever the case may be, okay, those controversial issues that are linked to identity are going to be the hardest for us to accept that we might be wrong. The hardest for us to hear that evidence that what we think might not be true. And it might underscore, or it might undermine some aspect of our identity that we hold very dear to, to our, personal, our personal view of ourselves in the world. Okay? So, it's important to underscore that we all do this. Okay? We all do this. Okay? The problem is, in some cases, this is being exploited, this sort of response. Okay? And in some cases, institutions and elites are letting people down. Okay? Rather than helping them form accurate opinions and judgments. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight are why are false and unsupported beliefs about the world so common? Okay? And again, I'm going to be focusing primarily on American politics, but those, there are experts in all different parts of the world in this room, and I'm sure you can all think of lots of different examples of that. Okay? And again, when I say false or unsupported, I want to be very clear. I'm talking about matters of fact, not opinion. We can all think of arguments we don't think are well supported on the other side of the political aisle from ourselves. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about here. So matters of facts and evidence. And why do people believe things that aren't true or are contradicted by the best available evidence about the world? Okay? Why is it when we give people corrective information about those beliefs, it so often f fails to change the mind of the people who are most likely to be misinformed in the first place? Okay? And finally, what, context, what role does context and do elites and institutions play in creating these misperceptions? Okay. 
Okay? And I'll explain a little more what, what I mean by that, but especially how politicians exploit these psychological tendencies and how the media might sometimes contribute to them or at least fail to counter them effectively. Okay, so again, just to be clear, I'm defining misperceptions here to mean beliefs that are false or unsupported by the best available evidence. And that's important because in many cases, we can't strictly rule out some incredibly implausible claim about the world. Okay? Those of you who study statistics, for instance, know that there's always some aspect of uncertainty in our estimates. Okay? Climate science, there's some, some scientific aspect of uncertainty about that. Okay? But that level of confidence is nonetheless very, very high. Okay? I can't prove to you that Saddam Hussein doesn't ha didn't have weapons of mass destruction hidden in some cave somewhere. Right? But we're very sure that that's almost certainly not the case. Okay? And that's often, that little glimmer of doubt is often what's going to be exploited, as we heard in the introduction. Okay? Because there always is some aspect of uncertainty about the world. Okay? But I still think it's important to not limit the scope of our inquiry to those things we can strictly prove to be false. Okay? So for instance, the claim that President Obama wasn't born in this country. Okay? I think we can definitively say is false. Why? Because not only do we have his long-form birth certificate, we have contemporaneous birth announcements in two newspapers in Hawaii. So unless someone got in a time machine, went back, and placed those birth announcements in those newspapers because he might run for president 45 years later, we can be pretty confident right, that he was actually born here. Okay? But that's not always true. That's an unusual case because the evidence is so strong. There are lots of other cases where people can find those glimmers of doubt. And even in the case of the birth certificate, right? even in that case, we have the birth certificate, we have the birth announcements, and yet, Somewhere around 20 plus percent of Americans believe President Obama wasn't born in this country. Right? So that's a great example of how even hard evidence is sometimes not enough. Okay. Now let me now introduce an important distinction that I think is going to be crucial in, in thinking about this issue of why people believe things that aren't true. And that's the distinction between being uninformed and being misinformed. Let me explain what I mean by that. People are uninformed about all sorts of things. I'm uninformed, for instance, about most of the natural sciences. Why? Because I didn't take any classes on those in college. I hope you did. Okay? But I know that I don't know anything about college-level biology. Okay? I'm well aware that I am not fit to stand up here and speak to you about the nuances of DNA. Okay? The difference is that some people are misinformed. Okay? And what I mean by that is they believe something confidently about the world that is false or unsupported by the best available evidence. Okay? And this is a distinction that my world of quantitative social science has neglected for a long time. We ask lots of survey questions. Do you know this and do you know that? So, for instance, do you know who the Vice President of the United States is? Right? Most people would know. But then we get to some harder questions. How many votes does it take to override a veto? Who is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court? Okay? And lots of people don't know the answers to those questions. Okay? But those are kind of trivia. I'm not sure how much those matter. Okay? I think most people are uninformed about those questions. They don't know the answer, but they're pretty well aware that they don't know who the Chief Justice is. And now everyone's thinking, who's the Chief Justice? Okay. <laughs> um, but when someone's misinformed, that's harder, right? Because they think they know the right answer. And it's going to be much harder to change their mind. Okay? And that's going to turn out to be a really crucial distinction in lots of these different debates, right? We're often talking about well-formed beliefs. These aren't top-of-the-head things you just made up in response to a question. This is a claim that's been echoing for a long time that you may hold very strongly. And you may think you know the right answer. And it's going to be that much harder to convince you otherwise because of that. Okay? Um, it's going to be especially hard to convince you that you might be wrong if that belief is linked to some aspect of your identity, some other belief or attitude that's significant to you, whether it's your party affiliation, your ideology, your gender, your sexuality, race, your religion, right? any of those things, okay, when these factual beliefs get linked up with those identity issues, okay, everything gets tough. Right? Because now you're not just admitting you're wrong, but you're admitting you're wrong about something which you have associated with this aspect of yourself that's important or salient or meaningful. Okay? And that's why I think sometimes misperceptions can be harder to correct more difficult, more pernicious than simply being uninformed. 
This is a really big difference because we've worried for a long time that people don't know enough about the world, for instance, to be good citizens. Like, do citizens know enough? And that's, a, that's an argument about whether citizens are uninformed or how uninformed are they. Okay? This is about whether they're misinformed. And it really may be worse. So this is a great quote that I think captures this distinction. So this issue has been echoing in different forms for a long time. This is from the 19th century. This is, uh, appropriately enough for this topic, um, often erroneously attributed to Mark Twain. Um, it was actually not said by Mark Twain. It was, it was actually uh, a claim by a contemporary of his name, Josh Billings. Okay? It's better to know less than to know so much that ain't so. And what he's saying there is that sometimes it's better to be uninformed than to be misinformed. Okay? I think that's a, a, a truth that we're going to be able to explore as we go through tonight. Okay, so how prevalent are misperceptions? Okay, again, I'm talking about the world of American politics first. Okay, very prevalent, very prevalent. You'll notice that those, this bar graph here, this is a percentage of Americans believing in two common misperceptions, um, that President Obama wasn't born in this country, right, and that the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks were aided or allowed by the Bush administration. As a survey data from 2010 and 2006, respectively. You'll see that those, you now we're breaking, we're disaggregating respondents here by their partisanship, right? Remember I told you identities matter. And in those partisan groups that are most susceptible to a given misperception, more than 40% of respondents are endorsing these myths. 40%. We're talking about <laughs> millions and millions of Americans here, okay? Remember I told you that aspects of people's beliefs matter in terms of what they do or do not believe. And I hope that's very striking to you as you look at this graph. There's a very steep partisan gradient to these two beliefs, right? Democrats are much more likely to believe 9-11 was an inside job than independents and independents and Republicans and vice versa for uh, the claim that President Obama wasn't born in this country, right? Highest among Republicans and declining as you move across to Democrats, okay? So what you believe depends a lot on who you affiliate with, which tribe are you a part of. And this is something, again, that our elites are often going to exploit. Okay. A second aspect of misperceptions, I want to give you some evidence. You know, again, so I'm a quantitative social scientist, so I'm going to give you evidence from, often from surveys. Okay. So here's some, survey, here's some more survey data to show you, hopefully, convincing evidence of this claim that I made to you, that misperceptions are often based on confidently held beliefs about the world. Okay. So this is two different... Uh, misperceptions about healthcare reform. Okay, so uh, our students in the room were not born at this time, probably, but this is the Clinton uh, healthcare reform debate of '93 and '94. Some of you may be just totally around somewhere, um, uh, but there was a common misperception in that debate that you would lose your choice of doctor completely, even if you paid out of your own pocket. The claim was that you would not be able to choose your own doctor. That claim was false. And that was, in fact, explicitly ruled out in the text of the bill. Still had a big impact on that debate. Okay? In the right panel, we have how likely people were to believe in the death panels myth, which was the most common myth about President Obama's health care plan in the 2009-2010 period. Okay? So what's most important to take away from this okay, is what happens as you move from left to right in these two panels. So on the x-axis here, I'm going to talk you through this, is when, we, when these two surveys ask people, how much do you know about that health care plan? How much do you know about Clinton's health care plan in 93? How much did you know about Obama's health care plan in 2009? Okay? So it's asking respondents at the time, how much do you think you know about this? Okay? Now, for the group that's predisposed to believe in these claims, right, which is, of course, the group that doesn't like the president in office, in this case, Republicans, as they, their own rating of their own knowledge, right, subjective knowledge, goes up, their level of misperceptions goes up, not down. Right? You see how that red line is going up as you move from left to right, both in the Clinton case and the Obama case. Okay? I hope that's troubling to you. <laughs> the people who think they know more know less. Okay? And that's going to make it really hard to change their mind. Very difficult. What happens when we do try to change their minds? People don't like it. They don't like it at all. Okay? This is a psychological, psychological phenomenon called disconfirmation bias. Okay? And what that means is, if I tell you something, 
If I give you a piece of information that contradicts some pre-existing view or attitude you have, you will be disproportionately skeptical of that information. Okay? If I give you a piece of information that confirms something you already believe, you will be not skeptical enough. Right? So when it comes to corrective information, when we're giving it to those people who are misinformed or most likely to be misinformed, they're going to have this disconfirmation bias. They're going to be disproportionately skeptical of that. They're going to be thinking, why is this not true? Why don't I believe this? What have I heard that would justify the belief I already have? Maybe not explicitly. Okay? We're very good at rationalizing these things to ourselves. Okay? But that's a process that I think is going to be going on. I'm going to show you some evidence of that. Okay. So, one thing you might worry about is, well, maybe people aren't hearing that corrective information. So let me give you a case where I think they could, almost couldn't have avoided it. The belief that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction immediately before the U.S. invasion. Okay. So in 2003, is when that U.S. invasion of Iraq happened, this claim was widely made by elites. Again, those of you uh, who are of uh, voting age probably remember this, right? Elites on both sides were saying Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. There were some dissenters, but I think it's fair to say there was an elite consensus that the, there were weapons there. Okay. After we invaded, it turned out they weren't there. And that, officially, that quickly became the consensus position of the United States government, okay, which released a report saying there were no weapons of mass destruction, there was no active weapons of mass destruction program. Okay. So if people were updating their views of the world, Belief in this should be plummeting to zero as we don't find those weapons of mass destruction. Right? This is an incredibly high profile issue. Those of you who were around at the time and watching the news, remember it was inescapable. Iraq was everywhere. And the, we kept not finding those weapons. Okay? So if people were updating their views of the world, that should be plummeting to zero. Okay? In 2003, 2004, after we go in and we don't find them and we keep not finding them and not finding them, and it becomes, again, the consensus position of the United States government. Okay. Instead, what we observe is that the belief in that myth flattens out around 40%, 40% of the American public. And the polling gets pretty sparse around 2006, so when the media basically stopped polling this issue. But my colleague Ben Valentino at Dartmouth polled this again in 2012 and found that still around 40% of Americans believed Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. And that, I think, is an almost, was at the time, an almost a very hard to avoid piece of corrective information. So, here's another example, a little more current, okay? For those of you where 2003 feels like ancient history, this is 2012. Does anyone remember reading about this? Okay, so there was an unemployment report. It came out in early October, about a month before the election, the last unemployment report that was going to come out before the election. So, seen as consequential. President Obama's economic record was kind of mixed as far as where presidents get reelected or not. So people put a lot of emphasis on the state of the economy heading into his reelection. It came out, the unemployment numbers came out slightly under 8%, which was a surprise. A little bit better than people expected. So Jack Welch, who's a former CEO of General Electric, put a tweet online saying the Chicago guys are changing the numbers insinuating some sort of conspiracy theory that the Obama administration had monkeyed with these numbers. Okay. There is no evidence to support this claim. Democratic and Republican economists immediately came out and said there was, it was absolute nonsense. Okay. The office that actually computes these numbers was still being run by a Bush appointee, I believe. Okay. So there, there's no evidence to support this whatsoever. Okay. So what happens? What happens? Okay. And just to foreshadow something for a moment, what I want to draw your attention to, and I'm going to show you some evidence for in a moment, is how the relationship you might expect between how much you know and the accuracy of your beliefs can be reversed. Okay? Now, the key to this is what I described to you before about how people can defend a belief they'd like to hold. Okay? Or link up their political views, say, with their factual beliefs. Okay? It's going to turn out, that's going to work in the opposite direction here. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you how in a moment. Okay, so, so I did a poll about this in 2012 before the election, and as you'd expect, Republicans were much more likely to say the Obama administration manipulated the unemployment numbers. They didn't like Obama, 
That's not a big surprise. Okay, Democrats are the least likely. Okay, none of this is breaking news. Okay, but here's what's more troubling. Okay, now I'm going to disaggregate. Remember, before I, I showed you how much people thought they knew. Now I'm going to show you a measure of objectively how much do they know. Okay, so we have a standard set of questions we ask people in political science to try to measure how much they know about politics. Okay, so I'm going to measure that objectively. Okay, and we're going to see how likely are they to endorse this myth. So as we move from left to right for each of these partisan groups, what you're seeing is a percentage of people who believed in that man. Okay? And again, remember, this is objective political knowledge. So Democrats, the more they knew, the less likely they were to believe this, okay? which is what you'd expect. But again, remember, this is a group that's predisposed to not like this claim. They're saying that a president they like is monkeying with the numbers in an illegal or illegitimate way. So that's not surprising. When you get to the group that's predisposed to believe in this claim, those Republicans who know more are more likely to believe in this. Know more objectively. Okay? So in some cases, when we know a little too much, it's dangerous. We're good at matching up those factual beliefs with what we'd like to believe about the world. Okay? And defending them even when we maybe might hopefully be able to know better. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some evidence of what happens when you give people that corrective information directly, okay, when you get this sort of response. Okay. So this is some experiments I did with a series of political issues. And what we did was we randomly assigned some people to get that corrective information and some people not. Okay? And we wanted to see, would it change their mind? What, would it reduce misperceptions? about a series of different political issues. I'm going to show you one example we did a series of studies. Okay. So this is an example of the kind of article we showed people. So we showed people mock news articles, the kind of thing you'd read in the paper. The misperception in this case was the claim that was frequently made by the Bush administration that uh, tax cuts would increase revenue, which is a claim that's virtually universally rejected by economists, including the administration's own economists. So what happens when we told people, actually, President Bush is suggesting that revenue is going up. In fact, it's going down. Do you agree or disagree that President Bush's tax cuts have increased government revenue? Okay. What happens if we give people this corrective information? Okay. So among liberals, belief in, the, in this misperception goes down slightly. They weren't that likely to believe it to begin with. But among conservatives, which are the group that's predisposed to believe in this claim, it doubles. <laughs> doubles. Okay? It's what we call the backfire effect. Okay? So when you challenge people and you provoke them by throwing facts and evidence in, at them about some controversial issue involving a controversial figure, okay, related to some aspect of their identity, in this case partisanship or ideology, it can provoke them to double down on that belief. Okay? And they might, in the process, end up being more likely to believe in it than they otherwise would have if you hadn't tried to correct it in the first place. So it isn't just a matter, a question of corrections being ineffective, they could be harmful if our goal is to bring misperceptions down. So, what's going on? Why are people so resistant? Now, it's hard to look into people's brains. I keep trying and it doesn't work. Okay? Your colleagues who put people in those MRI machines are trying that too, but that's still at a very early stage. Okay? So we have to work with what we have in terms of the available tools and technologies, okay, we're going to use a particular kind of approach. Okay? And here's the idea. We think it's very threatening to you to hear, that, um, to hear some piece of information when it contradicts or undermines some aspect of your worldview or sense of identity. Okay? If that's true, then if we make you feel better about yourself in some other domain or some other context, you should, that should buttress you against that threat and make you more comfortable admitting you might be wrong. Okay? So what we asked people to do was write a little mini essay about how awesome they are. Okay? How awesome they are. About something totally unrelated. And there's a whole social psychology literature on this. If you ask people to write, to think, to affirm their self-worth in some other domain, they can potentially be more open-minded about 
the topic of interest that they might otherwise be very defensive about. Okay. Another hypothesis we're going to test that I'm just going to briefly mention is that maybe we're not presenting information in the most effective way, and so we're going to give people graphical information okay, about the misperceptions we're testing and see if that's more effective than just text alone. Okay. So the example I'm going to show you is beliefs that our attacks on coalition troops in Iraq went down after the troop surge in 2007, 2008. If you remember that, there was a big surge in troops to Iraq to try to um, counter the insurgency that was going on there, and attacks went way down. Okay. So we were interested in whether people would believe that, given that many people had very strong feelings against the war in Iraq at that point, if you remember. Okay. So, um, we're interested in what happens to misperceptions when we did these two things. Either make people feel better about themselves or just give them the information directly, okay, in graphical form, okay? There's a lot going on in this graph, so I'm gonna walk you through it. Okay, look at me, not there, okay, for one second, okay? We're disaggregating people based on what we think is the relevant differentiating factor, which is how you feel about the war in Iraq, okay? By 2008, 2009, that's, a, that's an issue that people have pretty well-formed beliefs of that, right? If you remember, it was hard to change almost anybody's mind at that point. Okay, so the differentiating factor we're using is should we get out or not? And which was a relevant political question at that time. Should we withdraw or not? And we're disaggregating people into the ones who want to get out, the ones who want to stay, and the ones who aren't sure. Okay? And these are beliefs in the misperception that attacks increased during the surge. They actually decreased dramatically. This is the misperception. How likely are you to believe in the misperception? Okay. So who believes in this misperception most? Not surprisingly, it's the people who want to get out of Iraq. They think things are going terrible. Right? That's exactly consistent with the kind of story we've talked about. Okay? But two things. Remember, we tested two different things. The first, what happens if we show people the graph of those attacks dropping off? Okay? Belief in that myth goes way down. Okay? So that's good, okay? particularly among those withdrawal supporters, but also the not sure folks. Okay? But what's really interesting, if you're interested in this question of psychologically what's going on, is that when we affirm people's self-worth, in this group that's most likely to believe in this myth, the withdrawal supporters, you can see that misperceptions went down almost as much among the people who were affirmed in their self-worth as the ones who we showed the data to directly. Okay? So we think that's pretty interesting evidence, and we, we show similar evidence for a couple of different issues, that how, pe how threatening it is to get that information is a key factor in whether people are misinformed or can come to accurate judgments about the world. All right. So what about the role of elites? Right? So when we talk about, remember, the, the, the title of the conference is about manufacturing denial. So who's doing the manufacturing? Often it's elites. Okay? And I just want to give you a brief synopsis of the social science evidence on why that's so powerful. Okay? Um, when there's elite consensus, as there was, for instance, as I said, on the issue of weapons of mass destruction, that tends to lead to stronger support, particularly among people who or belief in this case in the given claim, particularly among those people who follow politics or are more aware of politics. Okay? Um, but when elites divide on an issue, that drives polarization. Again, especially among those people who follow politics or attentive to politics. Okay? And this is a couple of different examples okay? where you can see this shift happening on opinion issues. This is the Vietnam War when it was still a, con a democratic republican consensus in 1964. Okay? By 1970, once the parties had split, conservatives and liberals who pay attention to politics are miles apart on how they feel about that war. Right? And those of you who lived through that will, of course, remember that transition. Okay. The Gulf War, not quite as divisive. This is the first Gulf War. Um, right? But in the early period, okay, it's basically a consensus. And then Democrats and Republicans start splitting out okay, once their elites start disagreeing about the issue. Okay? And we're going to see that's happening with misperceptions often too. Why? Because we take our cues from elites. None of us have time to follow and form opinions about every issue. We tend to take cues from people we think have similar points of view, or we find credible or persuasive. 
Okay? Um, I'm going to skip that one. Let me go right to this. Okay? Climate change is a perfect example of this. Remember I said at the beginning, if it were just about the evidence, beliefs should be converging that climate change is happening. And instead we see the opposite. Okay? So as you move through this period, even just in the last approximately 10 years, this is 2001 to 2010, you can see liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, pulling apart on this issue. Why? Because they're getting those divergent cues from elites. Right? So the two sides are saying very different things about the reality of climate change and the evidence for it. And people are reflecting that back to us. Okay. And again, individual motivation is going to play a really important role in this. I'm going to go back to the slide now. This is, survey, this is from survey data estimating how likely you are to learn a salient fact at the time it's being debated in politics. It's from a bunch of different issues. Okay? The basic thing to font that they find okay, is that when you hear a fact that's congenial to your side of the debate, okay, let's say you want to invade Iraq, and the fact at the time was Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Okay? If that's congenial to your side of the debate, you're much more likely to get that question right. Okay? If it makes your side look bad or is an uncomfortable fact, you don't learn very much, okay? So when it's a positive fact for your side, Democrats learn more. Okay? When it makes their side look good, they're learning. Okay? When it, it's not, they're not. It's intersecting with a zero effect, meaning it's not doing anything. Okay? Same with Republicans. Okay? We're good at learning things that make our side look good, much less so when it makes our side look bad. Okay. All right. So I'm going to turn now to a little bit of evidence from outside the United States. Now again, remember, I'm an American politics expert, so big disclaimer here, okay? Um, I'm sure we can discuss these issues in the Q&A, but I think there's some suggestive evidence of how elites can matter for misinformation in other contexts besides the US too, okay? So again, remember, I study misperceptions, so that misperception that we talked about earlier about 9-11 and who did it, okay? There are other variants around the world, okay? So for instance, um, much of uh, the Arab Muslim world doesn't believe that Arabs carried out the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Okay? This is a very widespread misperception among Muslims in that region, as you can see. Okay? And you can imagine why that might be an uncomfortable fact. Okay? A co-religionist carried out what is widely believed to have been a trust. Okay? So, widely rejected. Okay? And there are many conspiracy theories about this right? that I'm sure you've seen or come into contact with in various ways to try to rationalize why it was that it wasn't Arabs who carried it out. Okay? Um, elites seem to play an important role. This is just some evidence from Pakistan talking about how elites often are encouraging these sorts of myths and misinformation. Okay? And um, we're going to see some evidence for that. Okay? The polling data aren't as good in other countries as in the United States, so we're limited in what we can see. I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of evidence. The first one is about the effect of education. Effective education. That's something we haven't quite talked about, okay? but I think it matters. And this is the evidence, okay? looking at the role of education in whether people believed in the 9-11 myth or not. Okay? And what these two economists who looked at the, those data, these are two economists who looked at those data I just showed you about uh, beliefs in uh, that the 9-11 attacks were carried out by Arabs in, among Muslims in the Arab Muslim world. Okay? And what they did was they differentiated people based on whether they went to college or not. Okay? But specifically, they looked at countries where university education was carried out, the percentage of university education that was carried out in English versus Arabic, which they're using as a proxy for Western influence in the educational system. Okay? And what they find is that in countries where there's a higher English share of uh, higher education, education is strongly associated with accurate beliefs, okay? I'm not even going to explain the coefficients to you. Just trust me on the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's called an interaction term. Those of you taking a statistics class, we can discuss that later, okay? But where Arab, the Arabic share is higher of the higher education system, that effect is muted, okay? That effect is muted, okay? Which suggests, doesn't prove, but suggests that the content of university education is changing its effect on whether people are vulnerable to this kind of misperception. 
Okay? There may be other explanations. We can talk about that. Okay? One other piece of evidence I think is interesting. Okay? So one thing that matters a lot is what are the incentives of, elite, of elites to put these myths out there in the first place? Okay? There's a really interesting article that finds that anti-Americanism in the Muslim world is not strongly associated with how pious that country is, the Muslims in that country are. Okay? It's strongly associated with how much conflict there is between the different wings of Islam within a given country. And the argument they make is that where there's that intense conflict, there are stronger incentives for elites to mobilize anti-American sentiment. So a poll came out recently of Holocaust denial in a whole series of different countries. So now we're right back to the topic of this conference, right? Holocaust denial, a fundamental topic of studying historical denial. Where is Holocaust denial highest? It turns out there seems to be a similar relationship where Holocaust denial is highest in those countries where Muslims perceive a strong conflict between modernizers and fundamentalists within their religion. And I think a similar argument might apply. Now, I'm not, a con I'm not an expert on these countries, okay? So I'm going to defer to those folks who are. But I believe it's consistent with that argument I described to you earlier, that where there's that sort of intense conflict within the religion, there may be stronger incentives to mobilize myths for political or religious advantage, including, perhaps, denying the Holocaust. Okay, so the incentives elites have can matter. That's the fundamental takeaway, I think. So, what can we do? All right, so now I've depressed you, hopefully. Okay, now I'm going to try to bring you back from the brink. Okay, and tell you that this is the all hope is not lost. There are things we can do, and I'm going to offer you a few suggestions, but I hope we can talk more about this in the Q&A. Okay, the first thing we can do is be realistic. Okay, this is not on the slide, but I just want to make sure everyone's hearing me on this. Human psychology is not changing anytime soon, right? I think we can all agree on that. So bemoaning the deep-seated tendencies of how we process information and reason about the world is not an especially fruitful approach, okay? In a lot of ways, individuals are the victims here, not the perpetrators, okay? I think a better approach is to think about how we can encourage elites like politicians and the media to serve us better, okay? And one way to do that is to hold the elites accountable directly, okay? Provide them with stronger incentives to make accurate statements and stronger incentives against making misleading ones. So I did a study where we randomly mailed uh, letters to state legislators saying, fact checkers are watching you in your state. Watch out, okay? <laughs> you guys have heard of the fact checkers, the fact checking movement? <laughs> Okay. So in states where those fact-checking websites were operating, the big ones, the PolitiFact state affiliates, we mailed them these letters saying, the fact-checkers are watching you. And the belief we had was that if we made salient that threat, that they would be held accountable for making a misleading statement, it might change their behavior. And what we found was they were much less likely to have the accuracy of their statements questioned if they got those letters in a control group. So this is, this is the, the difference. Now you can see that if you look at the labels on the y-axis here, that vertical one there on the side, they're very unlikely to be fact-checked no matter what. So we don't do this very often. It's quite rare, okay? But there was a statistically significant decrease, okay, uh, of about a percentage point and a half, which is more than 50% in relative terms, okay? So we cut that rate almost by more than half. Okay. So which we think is at least suggestive evidence that elites do respond to being monitored and held accountable. Okay. Now, how, you know, the exact details of how we might do that in a given context, we'd have to think about, right? Okay, not every case is like the United States, okay? But I think it's worth keeping in mind. Okay, second, how we cover news, okay? There's a practice, any student newspaper journalists in the room? Okay. There's a practice. I was about to attack journalists. Okay, I will. I will let it fly. Okay. Um, there's a practice within journalism of balance. Balance at all costs. If you say something from side A, you must say something from side B. Now, 
I think there's a, 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 a reasonable justification for that approach when it comes to matters of opinion. Okay? If you're practicing what we like to think of as objective journalism, in the, you know, which is the norm in American politics at least, then maybe that makes sense when it comes to matters of opinion. But it makes no sense when it comes to matters of fact. None. And yet you see it all the time. Okay? Someone says this about the world, someone says that about the world. Who knows who's right? Okay? Up is up, up is down. Make up your own mind. Okay? Now, that sounds ridiculous, but there's all sorts of examples of that kind of coverage. Okay? When it comes to the, the myth that vaccines cause autism, okay, one study found 60% of articles in the British press and 49% in American papers were artificially balanced in this way. Okay? That's, a, that's a myth that has direct consequences for public health. Children's lives are at stake. Okay? When it comes to climate change, okay, between 1988 and 2002, about 50% of the articles analyzed gave equal, relatively equal attention to the consensus scientific view and the skeptic view that's supported by very few scientists and very weak evidence. Okay? This matters. There's a study out of Stanford that looked at what happened when they randomly manipulated one skeptic in a TV news clip. Okay? One skeptic. Is a skeptic in or is a skeptic out? Okay? You put that skeptic in, okay? perceptions of belief, agreement among scientists on climate change go way down. Way down. Okay? How sure are you global warming is happening? Right? People much less sure. Okay? It's going down a lot. Just showing this one skeptic for about 30 seconds in this news clip is moving people's beliefs quite a lot. Okay? So we're really ill served by this practice. When it comes to matters where the scientific evidence or historical evidence is clear. Not all issues are like this, of course. I want to be very clear. There are plenty of issues that we don't know the right answer, and it's perfectly appropriate to say experts disagree. Okay? I would submit to you, though, that in cases where that's not true, this is not a responsible form of reporting. Okay. And there's some suggestive evidence that might matter. Now, this is not, we can talk about why this might be a spurious relationship. But an economist noted that in countries where people in the public believe reporters tell them what they think is going on, okay, in a strong sense, not in that U.S. sense, right? So remember, the U.S. sense is we're balanced, we're objective, we have no position, okay? The more reporters in that country try to say what they think is the truth, okay, the stronger the belief is in global warming, okay? The less reporters in that country try to tell people what they think is the truth, the less belief there is, okay? There's a pretty strong relationship there. Now, we can talk about whether that's a causal relationship or not, but I think it's at least suggestive. Okay. One other problem okay, that comes up a lot in US coverage of these myths, reinforcing the myth. Reinforcing the myth. Okay. Has anyone ever heard of Sheriff Joe Arpaio? Okay. This guy in Arizona who's a crackpot. And he's a sheriff of Maricopa County, and he uses that platform to do all sorts of media stunts and try to get coverage. And one of the things he did was he organized a posse to investigate President Obama's birth certificate. And he claimed to have evidence that the birth certificate was forged. Okay, this is a giant pile of nonsense. Okay? And yet this article, which was written in Politico, a very influential Washington news outlet, spent most of the beginning of the story, which is of course the, peop the part that people are most likely to read, reiterating his claim and reinforcing it. How much emphasis does the false part get? A lot. When do they bother to tell us there's no evidence for this? Way down here in one little paragraph. So what do we think most people take away from this? Okay. So the, the emphasis we give these claims should reflect the strength of evidence they have. This is reverse from the order we should have. Okay. Here's another example of how we can get that right. Okay. Here's a more optimistic example. CNN ran this great online story about a poll saying that people still believe President Obama wasn't born in this country. They just put a giant birth certificate at the top. Okay? Giant birth certificate, giant birth announcement. Okay? Right in your face. Okay? Much harder to deny, I hope, than just that little paragraph that we saw in the, Ar in the Arpaio study. Okay? So I'm going to wrap up and turn it over to our discuss it, and I hope we can talk about these issues more in the Q&A. But the thing I hope I've convinced you of 
is the deep psychological roots of misperception that often contribute to denial and make it so hard to correct. And in some cases make it in effect or even counterproductive to try to correct these sorts of misperceptions. Okay? But that doesn't mean we should give up. It means we should be smarter about how we address misperceptions and think about how we can do better. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have a lot that we can take away from, from what was really interesting and fact-based, which is very nice, statistically fact-based presentation, which is all too rare um, in our society, where I think generally talking about media coverage, um, we generally get very simplified and very um, sort of uh, mediated data um, that has already been sort of massaged in different directions. And it's sort of nice to see real data that we can if we don't entirely understand everything, we can, we can use to sort of uh, inform our opinions about this issue. Um, I'm, uh, I, what I think my role, which will be hopefully very brief, um, is, is maybe to amplify and connect some of the things that Professor Nihon has given us to think about, some of those conceptual tools that he's given us, some of the critical thinking tools that he's given us, to some of the other issues that this conference is about. Um, and, I, and I think there's a lot there. And I want to start, actually, by being a philosopher. And those who have known me in genocide studies and other things will be shocked to know that I'm actually in the field of philosophy and know things about Socrates and Plato and things like that that, that uh, you may never have heard me talk about. Um, but I was struck by a number of elements of the, the sort of critical insights that you were presenting that really connect with um, what in philosophy is, is the field of epistemology or the area of epistemology. That is, sort of how, what, what we're justified in saying we know, how we justify what we're claiming we know, and related questions like that. Um, and it's a very sort of central and long-standing field of philosophy. Um, and as I look at Professor Sharpton, I can't help but think of Quine and the, the web of belief concept where you presented the notion that when somebody is confronted with a fact that does not fit with what well, you were saying, sort of their, their uh, desires and, and sort of um, set of beliefs that they want to continue to hold, they are resistant to that new fact. And, and Quine is a famous 20th century uh, American philosopher, really made a, uh, you know, sort of had a real analysis of that, talking about the fact that we don't ever know anything in isolation. We never know one thing. What we have are actually a set of things we think we know about the world or we, uh, beliefs we hold about the world that aren't really connected to the world per se, but are more connected to each other. Does that sound sort of right? Uh, he's the better expert on this than I am. Connected to, to one another, right? And we have what's called a web of belief. And if we get a piece of information that contradicts one element in that belief system, all the other beliefs that we have that are connected to that one thing that's in doubt sort of come to the rescue and make us resist this new information. It takes a sort of critical mass of new information to get us to start to rework that web of beliefs that we hold in our head. And I think this is a very, a very useful way of thinking about the resistance that you're talking about, which I think is one of the important aspects of, of the discussion, is how amazingly resistant um, people can be when they're confronted with what, to somebody else who doesn't share that sort of same framework, would see as just an obvious fact. Um, and, and we should be very humble about this, and that'll be my second thing. One of the other things that you talked about was the tendency to think we know a lot about something, and the more that we're sort of misinformed, to become more confident in that. And for those of you who have taken you know, classes where you've read Plato, uh, either sort of talking about Socrates in a relatively, what's considered a relatively accurate way in his early dialogues, or using Socrates later on as more of a character for his own uh, philosophical uh, viewpoint, one of the, the sort of hallmarks of Socratic thinking is not being a philosopher in the sort of, I don't know what I'll call it, the, the sort of self-helpy mode that a lot of people think of as philosophy, but in a, in a sort of skeptical mode. That is that a lot of Western philosophy is not so much about creating new knowledge and generating you know, ideas about what we think we're speculating about, what we think we know, but rather trying to articulate the limits of our ability to understand things, to become more humble as we engage the world around us. And that sort of Socratic, one aspect of Socratic thinking in that way is to be very aware of the limits of our knowledge, both in terms of factual knowledge, but also in terms of, of the, the concepts that we can even get at. 
right? There are things in human existence that are what we'll call hopelessly speculative. We just can't have hard insights into them. And one of the things that Socrates, I think, taught us is to understand and appreciate those limits um, rather than doing exactly what you were telling us people have a tendency to do, and I'm sure I do this all the time because I'm a professor, that's what we're supposed to do is talk about things we don't know anything about but pretend we do. Um, but to, to sort of o almost co overcompensate in the opposite direction for our lack of knowledge by presenting ourselves as more knowledgeable. And I think there's another mechanism in there, sort of there's a, a I don't know, it's not a self-aggrandizement, but it's a, it's a, a mechanism where it's almost a, a, a sort of aggressive defense against feeling like we're ignorant of something um, and that we, you know, as human beings, I think, tend to have. Um, the last thing I would like to link, and this sort of follows the, the Quine issue, was when you talked about the sort of way in which our ideas about the world were linked to broader sort of outlook questions, how we see the world or how we want to see the world politically, for instance. And this starts to connect us, I think, right to genocide. And, and there are scholars in this room who have done tremendous work along these kinds of lines and looking at the, the way that belief structures impact not just denial of historical facts, but also belief structures that lead to mass violence, which are often very linked together. Um, and one of the things that I found very striking in the case of gen in, in different genocide denials, but also in contexts in which mass violence happens, is the degree to which individual identity becomes tied to a group identity. Um, and dependent on, I think I'll use the United States in a moment as an example, but dependent on a, a sort of um, positive group identity for a positive individual identity or sense of individual identity. So for instance, in the United States, I would say that there are, there are two elements that always sort of strike me. One is that we don't commit genocides. Um, which is factually, I say as a genocide scholar, factually wrong. We've been doing it since before we were a country, and we've done it right up until, you know, I mean, Guatemala, take your, I mean, all sorts of cases where we've been complicit, where we've helped, where we've done it ourselves. But when you say that to people, particularly if you start talking about Native Americans in the United States, when you say that to people, there's a, a psychological crisis. It's not like you can present letters from George Washington saying wipe out all the food of Native Americans around here because we want to wipe out their population. You can present that. People just don't want to believe it because they can't accept, not that they love George Washington and everything, not, not that so much as it starts to call into question the very way we think about our national identity, which in turn, when we become dependent for our individual identity on national identity, becomes a sort of existential question for the individual. What am I if I have to doubt my, this, this belief about my country, about me, you know, which is really a belief about myself? And I think that's a powerful, and I think you, you brought that out for us, I think that, that tendency to want to believe things that way. Um, I, there are a number of other things I would just very briefly mention to sort of connect us to other panels that will be happening in the, in the conference. And one of the things that I think links sort of political issue denial, which is, I think, the, the, the core of what you're talking about, although you, you touched on a number of, of different things. Science denial, genocide denial, and, and there are other kinds of denial that are out there. And that is the fascinating way you can line up turns of thought, arguments, and, and attitudes across what are very different kinds of things. You get statistical arguments denying the prevalence of sexual assault in the United States or in other societies. You get statistical arguments about the effects of cigarette smoke. You get statistical arguments about global warming, the denialist arguments. You get statistical arguments about how many people died in the Holocaust and what percentage were actually you know, the victims of direct murder and all these kinds of things. You get the same kinds of, not just general statistical arguments, but you get the same kinds of arguments. You get people minimizing the impacts, for instance, um, victim counts or instances of violence um, and so forth. Um, and that sort of, that should give us a clue to the fact that something's wrong across, when we start seeing patterns like that. Um, and again, as a philosopher, I'm very interested in sort of argument patterns and rash, you know, sort of lines of thinking patterns that come up. And I think when we start to see the, the way these relate to one another, it gives us another tool maybe to start to get people to think critically. Um, almost using analogy. People won't think critically about an issue that they're committed to in the way that, that you talked about, but if you can line that up with something else that they'd be very willing to, to, to see as a denial problem, right? They may not accept global warming, but they understand 
that the Holocaust happened. And if you can start to make connections among those things, in some cases you can get people to think a little bit more critically, to see the, so their own fallibility in the thing that they're, they're trying to deny. Um, I'll just say uh, one more thing, and then I'll t I think we should turn it over for, for question and answer. And I think one of the other problems that's come up in the United States recently is a sort of a muddling of different expertises, if I can say it that way. And, and I want to say that specifically, and I'm going to be a philosopher again, going back to Kant, and a very important distinction he makes, which is developed from earlier philosophy, between reason and faith. And he does this very interesting thing, which is says, there's a realm in which sort of scientific discourse and reason make sense. The material world, the world of, of politics and so forth, where you can talk about facts on the ground that you can confirm. I mean, you wouldn't say it exactly that way. I'm sorry, we won't get into the technical things. But we'll say facts for our purposes. And logic, logical analysis based on, on you know, legitimate uh, information. And then there's a whole other realm of things where we can't have that kind of knowledge. Right? We can talk endlessly about what happened at the moment of the Big Bang. What we can't figure out is what happened before that because there was no time, there was no space, there was no existence. And that's forever outside our realm. And there's a comfortable way, you know, people talk about how do you, you know, resolve science and, and faith and there's all these, you know, sort of struggles over that. But that Kantian model seems to me pretty reasonable, right? You can, you know, as philosophers, sometimes we have to speculate about things we don't know about, but we try not to do that about things that we can have direct knowledge about, right? But what I think has happened in the United States is a tendency for people in different areas to sort of jump into other, other areas. So for instance, evolution is a good example. You can talk about how the universe started, right? That's something we have to speculate about. We don't have facts about that, and that's where religious faith, you could argue, is necessary, not just uh, a, a possible, but necessary. But if you want to talk about what the line of descent is from, you know, a, a, I don't know, an amoeba to, you know, a multi-celled organism, there are facts about that that we can, we can see in the world, we can test out, right? And what's happened in our society is sort of a reversal of the critical thinking that arose, I think, in the 1600s and on. Um, and again, there's a lot of philosophers here who probably have a lot to say about why what I'm saying is probably not correct, but hopefully it's somewhat on the right track. Um, and I'll refer to Chris Waters, who's another one of my colleagues, who, who really had this great model of talking about Descartes and the revolution he, he sort of generated in, in thought, where you know, the transition that Descartes really marks, maybe came up with, or at least you know, shows us, is the move from the idea that authority determines truth to the idea that each individual person has the reasoning capacity to make good judgments about what's true and false. And that has incredible political implica implications. It's the basis of democracy, the idea of real democracy. It's the basis of so much else. And that allowed us to recognize that we all have the capacity to be critical thinkers. Um, and we can spend a lot of time, and hopefully in the question and answer, about why that critical thinking itself has gotten perverted in different ways. But what's happened in recent years is a it's sort of political, religious, and other authorities have sort of inserted themselves against this ability that individuals have. So people now in our society, I think, and, and I think in a lot of other societies, have much more of a tendency to abandon their own ability to think through issues and get facts, even though it's difficult, I agree with you, to get all, all the facts. As those who are in authority have sort of claimed the right to make decisions about facts of matter based on things like faith, political viewpoint, and so forth. I hope that makes some sense. Um, and it's a very dangerous tendency as we come back to the issue of genocide, because I think whenever you get the, in a situation where people are willing to sort of give up their own critical thinking in favor of an authority deciding how they should think about something, we start to get the very problems that, that generate the issues that the conference is looking at. Let me stop there. There's uh, obviously a lot of questions and comments that you probably want to have for Professor Nyhan. So let's turn it over to you. Genocide denial, and then challenge you a bit to go further 
in your presentation. I appreciate what you have to say, especially about uh, balance. I think it was Harry Truman who said uh, that he would like to have in this world a one-handed economist. Because every time he called and asked an economist for an opinion about monetary policy, the answer was on one hand this and on the other. And he said, God damn it, I want a one-handed uh, economist so I can figure out what to do. The issue is about balance. And I think you came out very well with it when you talk about the journalistic practice, and I did practice journalism for a while and taught it, uh, of, of having on the one hand this opinion, the opposing opinion, and what that does for a misinformed or an uninformed audience. I think it's a very important uh, purpose uh, to look at. The, the practical application is right now, the government of Rwanda has just voted to suspend the BBC's license and operations in that country and to kick them out of the country because of a documentary that was broadcast on October 1st in which there was on the one hand and on the other hand of uh, issues revising what happened in 1994, and the uh, survivors of genocide and the, and the parliament of the country decided that uh, amounted to genocide denial, and therefore there, there have been protests and so forth. But they've just taken this action now to suspend the operation of the BBC inside the country and expel all the journalists who are associated with that organization. And the reason that came about was, first of all, the journalistic practice of trying to balance both sides. Okay, here's a narrative of what happened, including the facts, and even a video that BBC shot during the time of the genocide showing the massacres. And then this revisionist article, uh, uh, argument that came about in the documentary where among those quoted denying genocide are academics from the United States, American professors from Michigan State and, and elsewhere. Maybe some of them are in this room, I don't know. But the issue is balance and what it does to the audience where you have credible institutions like the BBC, like the media organizations, like even the U.S. Holocaust Museum that has been accused of allowing itself to be manipulated to carrying a genocide denial message by giving stage to the one hand that is promoting denial and falsehood. That's one part of the argument. It shows very practical implications for this business of how we practice journalism. But my greater point is to challenge academics who the media depend on for their credibility and for data and for their stats like you just demonstrated. Very few organizations are going to go out to media organizations on their own and make those claims if they can't hide behind some academic study, some study that was done by university professors in every domain, scientific, political science, or whatever. So my question and challenge to you is, as you said, what is the role of elites in denial? They are the primary deniers because they give cover others who cite them and cite facts and data. So what is the responsibility then of, journal of academics, as you rightly point out, a journalist can help to misinform and spread denial and manufacture uh, falsity yeah. with this balanced approach? Right. Um, okay. What about academics? Do they not have a responsibility to be one-handed? and to point to what is accurate and what is factually correct rather than... Sure, I mean, when, when the evidence is one-handed, absolutely. When the evidence is one-handed, absolutely. And of course, there are lots of things that all of us study that are very two-handed, right? The world is complex, and so I don't want to suggest that everything is that black and white. But when this evidence is overwhelming, when the scientific consensus is very strong, I do think people have an incentive, sorry, responsibility to reflect that in their comments. The problem is, I think this is driven less by academics than by journalistic practices. And let me tell you why. There's a, in some cases, journalists are looking for someone to balance their stories. There are websites journalists will go to to try to find people to represent a point of view or a perspective. And so, and there's of course an incentive to provide those people, often in the guise of expertise of some sort. So I don't know that you can ever exhaust that supply of skeptics. What I would like instead our journalists to take seriously their responsibility to, con to convey the weight of the evidence. And the problem with that balanced sourcing is, is precisely that 50-50 notion that if you quote this person and that person, you've given one person from each side, that looks like a 50-50 issue when it's really a 98-2 or 100-0. And so I think the media institutions have to take their seriously their responsibility to reflect that. Now, some of them are. The problem is it's, it's very much an issue-by-issue -issue matter. 
Okay, so let me give you an example. Some media organizations have taken the step consciously to no longer balance their climate stories. And that's something that's been happening just in the last five or ten years. But that's only after that issue going on and on and on. Okay, and them coming under pressure for years and years and years. Okay, the LA Times, for instance, stopped running climate denial letters. They just said, we don't think this is consistent with the evidence and we're just not going to publish these things. Now that's a very strong precedent that we have to be very careful with, right? If that's misused for political reasons, if newspapers just start saying, I'm not going to print this or that letter I don't like, that's probably something we find trouble with, okay? But if that's exercised carefully and with responsibility, I think it can, it can reflect important judgments about the weight of the evidence. So really what I want you to do is to say to the media, you should reflect the weight of the evidence. And if you're a substance matter expert, and the weight of the evidence in your field is not being reported, go interact with the media. Okay? So in my field of political science, but I think this is true more generally, most academics are completely disengaged from the media. They find it very frustrating, and they have a tough time uh, communicating effectively in that medium, and they kind of give up. Okay? And as a result, the, 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 the view of expertise that those folks in the media are getting isn't often representative of the fields they're actually interacting with. Okay? So, um, I'd like to see academics uh, reaching out to the media and trying to convey that evidence in their field. Yeah, please. Uh, I have a two-part question. One really follows up on what was just asked, but I had a question about some of your statistics. Mm -hmm. have, uh, do you have evidence that, that relates to the age of the individual in terms of the kind of I identity they have and the ability to correct because you're saying that the more you try to correct someone who's committed to a position, the more strongly that person will hold that position. Uh, as an educator, I'm concerned with, with, with people at a younger age and whether you see any, any distinction between, uh, I mean, has, has studies been done with high school students or college students as opposed to those who are voting uh, um, in the 20s or 30s? And the sec second question has to do with, with the question that was raised just now, and I call it sort of a vicious circle with regard to uh, pri uh, public universities and the fact that often we have politicians um, who have strong beliefs that are often based on very few facts, uh, these skeptics having an inordinate role in the governance of public universities, um, and they claim they're reflecting their constituency, and they put pressures on universities to be balanced in the way that uh, is quite dangerous, as we pointed out, when balance uh, has to do with established facts, uh, and they, they exert pressure, we find this in, in the question of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the belief in the, the origin of the universe, and and those sorts of things. Uh, so that, that's one, one danger I know that academics seem to have, and it really touches on, on really academic freedom. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say, you're right, that, that the issue of, of political pressure on educators is something we see both at the K-12 level and in universities. And again, it can be those, those folks in the public side are the most susceptible because they're dependent on the public officials. Uh, who often are politicized in this way. So let me just say I agree that that's a, that's a significant concern. On the first point about age, I don't know that there's a strong relationship with age. Um, we have results, some of the results I showed you there were college students, some of them were general populations of adults. We don't look at minors because that's a more complex issue in terms of getting consent and doing appropriate studies. But among adults, I don't have strong reasons to suspect heterogeneity in the data that I've shown you. I will say, though, that this is either going to be encouraging or discouraging, depending on your age. Um, Middle-aged people have been found to be the most uh, closed-minded in their views, right? So that's where I'm heading, so I'm not, I'm not bashing you if you're in that category, right? Um, so there seems to be this kind of setting into your views phase that some people reach. So there might be some concern about that, but I haven't seen any evidence yeah, of that. It's often the case that we talk about critical thinking, but by the time you're in, in, in university, a lot of what you've been uh, conditioned to with regard to your, your social environment and your family has already been set. So, you know, critical thinking at, 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 at high school or even before high school and grade school, I think is, is essential here so that when 
when you reach those ages of sort of maturity, when you're engaged in the political process, uh, that that ability to, to cor correct and not get sedimented in, in your view. So it'd be interesting for studies to be done on these same issues for younger people. Yeah, and let me just add one thing, which is that, of course, education does cut both ways, because it also equips you to defend those beliefs that you'd like to defend, right? Critical, we'd like to think that teaching critical thinking skills helps us be more skeptical of our own views and the basis for them. But in some cases, it can help us better align our beliefs with our attitudes and defend those beliefs we'd like to have, right? So I'm not so sure that relationship is clear, but it's an interesting question. Yeah, all the way in the back, please. So when your solution is sort of says Germany was going to be a mountain, but how do you take into account this epistemic closure where people go to certain websites, certain news sources, and then right, your yeah. business model also depends on for generating that kind of content? I just wrote, okay, so, okay, so, so forgive the self plug. I just wrote an article about this today from the New York Times, so please go read it. Um, <laughs> sorry, okay, that's the only one. It's a great question, okay, people ask it all the time, okay? Are people in their own little information cocoons? Are we only hearing news we want to hear? So in other words, is the problem not that you're rejecting that information that you don't want to hear, but that you aren't hearing it in the first place? The best evidence suggests that we actually aren't. Okay? And this is something that many people have feared, that cable news and the internet have made it easier and easier to surround yourself with like-minded information. That's true in theory. In practice, very, very few of us may exert the effort to do that. Okay? So both television and radio data and internet data show that people actually tend to watch or listen to or read relatively centrist news outlets. That's a vast majority of their news diet, the kind of mainstream media. And the ideological news that they are exposed to actually is much more balanced than you suspect. It's only a tiny handful of Americans who are really in those cocoons, literally on the order of 1% to 3%. Okay, so very, very small. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be worried about that because the technology is getting better and better. If you monkey with your phone enough, I'm sure you can construct a little cocoon of your own. right? But it, 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 it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem as people would fear. Okay, and I definitely hope you'll, you'll check out the article and it, it links to some studies on this. Yeah, please. Uh, I, I think Tony gave a, an interesting and possibly correct analysis. You know, I, I hold a bunch of views, they fit together, an inconvenient view gets submitted, right? And I've got the choice of either accepting it and having to revise a ton of stuff or rejecting it. Right? And sometimes it's easier to reject it. I mean, I'm making psychological guesses here, but it seems to me that sometimes it's easier to reject it. Um, you talked a number of times, a number of your examples had people who had misconceptions, misperceptions, the truth was introduced. Um, and then, but, but I want to speculate and, and just hear what you think about this. Uh, there's what people believe and what they'll come to believe given the truth uh, and so forth. And then sort of a step beyond that is what they'll do uh, sort of based on the belief. In other words, they're likely to be more skeptical of the person who introduces that belief. You never said sort of how that belief got introduced. Mm -hmm. So that, it seems to me that they're likely to be more skeptical about the person, it's sort of a reverse ad hominem argument, who introduced that belief. Ooh, sorry, who introduced the corrective information or who the misleading the claim? Corrective information okay. Because yes. they're comfortable with okay. what they got. Sure, sure. Okay. They're likely to be more skeptical of that person, which is likely to lead to attitudes toward that person and people like that, which in the worst case can lead to terrible stuff. I mean, ter you know, there, there's what people believe, and then it's acting on the beliefs that's the that I think everybody is concerned about. Right. Uh, and sort of, you, you didn't say much about that. You just it, you talk like a philosopher. <laughs> like we always talk, as if it's just I'll take that as a compliment. The other thing I wanted to say is you talked about sort of making people feel better and what that does. And when Henry was talking about Socrates, all I could think is, all Socrates does is make people feel worse and worse and worse. <laughs> right. um, and, and how does that work? Um, but anyway, I mean, it's really like, yeah, you know, so so <laughs> I mean, do you think that makes any sense that, I mean, they'll be skeptical of the introducer of that, yes. not just of the fact itself, yes. but of yes. the person who introduced the fact, and then whatever follows from that, I mean, it could lead to hatred in the worst instance, but I don't like you or people like you. 
you know, smart right. aleck academics or do whatever. You know, yes. Yes. No, I'm, I'm glad you raised that. So one, one thing we didn't talk about, the different ways people resist that unwelcome information. And there are a number of different mechanisms that you might imagine would go on. And one of them would be this source derogation, thinking of reasons not to believe in that source, that you don't like that source, that that source isn't trustworthy. And you can imagine different sorts of reactions that might generate. So for instance, distrust of the media in the case of US politics may be worse in other context. Um, in terms of how this leads to behavior, I don't know. Again, I studied the US context. But let me give you one example of how it can translate into behavior. It's a little different from what we've talked about. I did a study of vaccine misinformation. That's another issue that there's people have very strong views about. And it's hard to correct the myths that are out there, including that vaccine autism myth I mentioned to you earlier. And when we did a study of this with parents and we told them that vaccines don't cause autism, they actually accepted that myth. The beliefs in that in the autism myth went down, so the correction worked. But among those folks who were most skeptical of vaccines to begin with, they were less likely to say they would vaccinate a future child, not more. Okay? So in some cases, what happens to behavior may not be obvious. Right? So the myth went down, but that it called into question their more general feelings about vaccines. And they may have thought, well, OK, fine, vaccines don't cause autism, but here's some other concerns I have about them. They start thinking about that in the process of resisting that unwelcome information, and it's seeming to lead towards a different behavior than people might have intended. Okay, so that's at least one example. Yeah, please. Uh, you show this particular graph about uh, people, Democrats and Republicans who believe in nine eleven conspiracies and uh, the birth certificate thingy, mm -hmm. and they were exact mirror images of each other in terms of percentages, which is really interesting because I mean, given the birth certificate thing, it got a lot of coverage in mainstream media, Fox News, etc. But I don't think 9-11 conspiracies got that much coverage in no. mainstream mass media. No. So media coverage is not the issue here. There is something else. And I, I'm wondering what that is. So that uh, makes me think. Maybe there's an exogenous determinant that make people tend, uh, like, make people tend, show tendency to believe in like any type of information that is against the current in, uh, embedded information. Like that, maybe that's like a product of our culture. Like there is a, there's going to be a certain percentage of people who are going to believe, just disregard what the uh, main knowledge is. And that, again, thinking about moon landing, for example, that's an event that happened 45 years ago. It's a patriotic uh, moment in US history. So you would assume that Democrats, Republicans, whatever, they would just you know leave it. But there are still moon landing conspiracies too. So, I was thinking, is there a like, quantitative study that looks at the time passed since the original incident, or like shock value of the incident, media coverage in general, not just conspiracy, but like the main event as well, or polarizing, the, I don't know, like, just, it, it is really shocking that how those, like, those two graphs were mirror images of each other, and how, you know, there's just a certain percentage of population that there is there, no matter what the issue is. Right, yeah. So those are some really interesting points. So there's a lot of differences between the cases we've talked about and exactly the way you're describing in terms of how much coverage that misinformation got, the level of an elite endorsement. And what I think that suggests is that in some cases, people are kind of piecing this together themselves more. The 9-11 conspiracy theory was endorsed by very few national level Democrats, really only Cynthia McKinney, who was a member of Congress, and Howard Dean kind of hinted at it once, who was a fairly prominent uh, Democratic figure after his 2004 presidential candidacy. Um, but in general, very few Democrats touched that, whereas the Obama wasn't born in this country thing was quite widely at least hinted at or discussed or joked about by national level Republicans. So what that suggests is in some cases, elites are feeding the fire, right? And in some cases, now to mix metaphors, we're connecting those dots ourselves, right? Um, in terms of whether we have data to try to distinguish these things, um, the answer is not really, okay? And this is partially because we haven't studied this stuff very often. There just isn't a lot of data. Um, so especially making those sort of comparisons that you'd like to is very difficult. Um, but one other thing that we haven't talked about is there may be something about conspiracy theories that are, that are unusual or particular too. So 9-11 is terrifying, right? The idea that two building, you know, buildings get knocked down out of nowhere. 
And we find that very frightening as human beings, this idea that you know, lives can be extinguished in an instance. So there are often these conspiracy theories around catastrophic or destructive events, unexpected tragedies of that kind. JFK's assassination being the most obvious example, right? But there are many others. So those kinds of conspiracy theories, there, are, there is some work on why people might be most vulnerable to, more vulnerable to them to reassure themselves. But that wouldn't necessarily tell you that Democrats would be so much higher. Okay, so I think there's a lot more work to be done on that. Yeah, please. Okay, it's two parts, actually. My question is two parts. Well, first, I don't know how you're going to deal with this fact that Glenn Beck actually changed his mind. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about that? Uh, on what? On which? I don't know. One of the, those things that he was making. Okay. He <laughs> endorsed a lot of it. He changed yeah. his actual mind. I, I, he changed <laughs> his mind. And he's now. I, I taught a class on this, and I just showed Glenn Beck clips over and over. <laughs> Okay. I think what I'm going to say now is related to this, but I'm not going to talk about that very long. But um, now we are trying to foster sort, some sort of, I mean, you will call it scientific, I don't call it scientific, skepticism with, the, uh, with our students. We want them to be skeptical people. Now, uh, I think um, maybe that's what I heard the discussant was trying to say this to in a way. Maybe I heard them with my own concerns. I mean, do you differentiate between doubt that, you know, that doubts everything that makes sense, and side, the skepticism that we try to foster. The reason why I'm saying this is because um, I don't think we can foster skepticism when um, we keep calling we keep calling people the things that make sense to people as misconceptions and misperceptions and factual. I mean, we can throw all the facts to their faces. If they, that doesn't make sense to them, if that doesn't fit to their webs of belief, or Foucault would call it truth regime, then they're not going to hear you. So in that sense, I mean, by calling these things not, uh, misconceptions, um, are we really fostering uh, the healthy skepticism that we want everybody to have? So can we find a different way? Why is it that? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's psychological. I really don't think it's psychological. Why is it, if it was psychological, like, Glenn Beck wouldn't change his mind? Um, why? What? I'm not sure I agree with that, but okay. <laughs> okay. Why is it that people stick with these ideas, or whatever they are, the fact that it, they make sense to them one way or another? So maybe there's another way of going around that than actually throwing facts to their faces. Because, like, like the discussion was saying, most of our thinking process is made up of faith anyway. We're not people of facts. We are people of... No, very much not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me just say, I'm, I, I, I don't think we disagree nearly as much as you think we do. Because what I was trying to suggest at the, at the end there was that precisely that throwing facts at people isn't the best approach. But we should think creatively about what might be better. Okay? So when I use the term as perceptions, I want to separate the scientific term that I'm trying to explain to you and what I think would be the most effective strategy. I don't think it's the most effective strategy to say, you are misinformed. And I'm going to tell you you're wrong. That's a terrible strategy, right? My job as a scientist is to try to label things as precisely as I can. So that's why I use that term here. Okay? But there may be ways to talk about these issues that's more effective, and it allows people to not feel like their identity is being challenged. 